Hi guys, today I'm going to do a really short lesson on classification, which all classification is, is how you group objects. Okay, and most of the times you do it based on similarities. So as an example, any grocery store you go into is actually classified, right? Um, and I don't mean top secret, I mean it's just grouped. There's a produce section, a meat section, a dairy section, canned food section, etc., etc. Okay, um, when we used to have uh, music stores, like they would organize music based on genre, right? Like you'd have the new releases, the country music, um, and they still do libraries this way. You might have like an encyclopedia section, a children's section, different things like that. So when they do that in biology, they usually put them into a group called a kingdom, and then they split them up as we get more and more characteristics that are um, less common to all of them. Okay. All right. So one of the first people to actually work on a classification scheme was Aristotle. And you guys can tell by the date on the screen. That was a long time ago. Aristotle wasn't even a scientist, but they actually went to him for everything. Math, like philosophy stuff, all kinds of stuff. So what he did is he put things into two groups. He made a plant group and an animal group. Now, what was interesting about that is we actually have way more organisms now that are not in those two groups. We have fungi, we have um, bacteria, and we have protists. But I think is what it was is a lot of those other things weren't seen. They were too tiny to be seen with a naked eye. Or maybe they thought fungi, like mushrooms and mold and stuff, were actually plants because they grew out of the ground or they were green or whatever. Okay, so let me move this over. And um, after he put things into plants or animals, he did it, I'm thinking, by their size. Because plants, he considered them either, either an herb, a shrub, or a tree. And then with animals, he did something different. He classified them as land, water, or air. And the air one is the one that really confuses me, but I'm guessing he was thinking of birds because everything has to land sometimes, right? And everything that lives on land technically is in the air. So let me move this, and I want you to tell me what some of the problems you see are. Like this is a frog, obviously, right? So did he consider that land? Did he consider that water? Um, because they do hang out in the water. And a frog starts his life as a tadpole, right? So did he think the tadpole was a different animal than the frog? Or did he classify the tadpole as a, a water animal and then classify the frog as a land animal? So even though his um, grouping was very flawed, they used this for like 2,000 years, okay? Because I think they just didn't know any better. All right, and then the next one who um, came along was Carolus Linnaeus. He was from Sweden, and he was a naturalist, which means he studied, you know, all living things pretty much. And he decided not to do things by, um, like, a whim of, of where they lived or anything like that. He actually looked at their characteristics. So he put them into groups based on their body structure or based on how they got food. Okay, or their body systems. And then he also came up with binomial nomenclature, which basically just means we name things with two names. Okay, you can see the horse here is called Equus Cabalus. Um, and I don't mean two names like Christine Wayne. Okay, I mean like a scientific name. And the reason they use Latin, if you can tell what that is, and the reason they did that is because Latin is kind of like a universal language, and it's the basis of all other languages. So like you and I would call that a horse, but people in other countries obviously have a different name for it. But scientifically, that horse is Equus Cabalus all over the entire world. Okay, and you guys probably already knew that anything that is equine is related to a horse. Okay, all right, so let's go into that a little bit further. Taxonomy is actually the branch of science that groups and names organisms. So if they were to discover um, some new fish deep in the ocean today, they would run its DNA and see what it's closely related to, and then they would figure out what groups of stuff it belongs in. Obviously, it would be in the animal kingdom, 
okay? And it probably has a vertebrae, so it would be in the vertebrate group, but then they would have to figure out what it is more closely related to before they can actually give it a scientific name. Okay, now each group, the reason they call it taxonomy, each group has a fancy name and it's called a taxon and plural is taxa. Okay, so I know you guys have heard the term species, right, because we've done that. You may have even heard genus or kingdom. Those are taxon, taxa. Okay, those are groups that we organize things in. All right, and then um, here is the order that you guys have to memorize, and I'll show you a mnemonic device in just a minute. So kingdom is the broadest. That's like saying, yes, that's an animal. It's a plant. It's a fungus. Okay, we have six kingdoms now. When I was in high school, there were only five, and we'll talk about that uh, later on. Um, then you take the kingdom, like the animal kingdom, and you split it into more groups. Okay, so in this case, phyla, for animals, you split them into animals with a backbone and animals without a backbone, all right? Then, as you go further down, you take those groups and you divide them into classes. So, an example of a class that you guys probably already know are mammals, okay? They're in their own little group um, because of their characteristics. And then, as you go further down, you get more and more specific until you get down to the species, which is one particular type of animal, like a red-breasted robin, okay, or like a snow leopard, things like that. Okay, so it's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Now, here's a mnemonic device that might help you remember um, that. There are millions of them floating around. You guys probably learned one in math, like the order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Or some of you may be in a higher math, like Sokotoa with the sine and cosine stuff. Or Oscar had a heap of apples. That's a mnemonic device. So one that is printed in a lot of textbooks is this one here, King Philip came over for great spaghetti. Um, in my biology textbook when I was in high school, it actually said King Philip came over for grape soda because grape soda was really big in the 80s. Doesn't matter, okay? You just have to memorize this particular order. So kingdom's the broadest and, and species is the most specific, okay? So like we said before, um, and I'll use something different. Kingdom could say, this is a plant, okay? And then species could be something like, this is Eastern poison ivy, okay? So that's how that works. And remember, in order to be in the same species of something, that means you, have, you can reproduce successfully, okay? All right, okay, so we started talking about scientific names. I just wanted to review that with you real quick. Um, we have two names based on their genus and species, okay? Our full classification name contains all seven of those categories, but we normally limit down to genus and species. So Ursus maritimus is the scientific name for a polar bear. Ursus is the genus, maritimus is the species. So how that works is Ursus is like the noun that tells you it is a bear, and then Maritimus is the species. It's usually an adjective that describes the noun, okay? So Maritimus means maritime, and I don't know if you guys have ever been to a maritime museum. It means ocean, okay? Marine, basically. So is a polar bear an ocean bear? Yes. So that is a really good description for him. Okay, and notice the scientific name, it has to be italicized, or if you can't italicize it, like if you're handwriting it, it needs to be underlined, just like a title of a book or magazine. Okay, and Linnaeus is the one who came up with this particular naming structure. All right, so we talked about Ursus maritimus being a polar bear. Okay, what about Ursus horribilis? Well, it tells you a couple of things, okay? A, it is not a polar bear because it is not maritimus, okay? B, it tells you that it's probably some kind of bear because it is using ursus. Anybody wanna guess what horribilis is? It's a grizzly bear, okay? So that tells me that though a polar bear and a grizzly bear cannot mate, okay? Now, you may have learned in earth science that there are some instances that they have, and maybe that's because of convergent evolution. We're not sure, okay? All right, so let me just show you some other ones that I actually think are, um, I don't know where to put this, 
are, are kind of funny. Okay, so you guys probably heard of the dog. You know, anything dog related is canine. Anything cat related, sorry, that's the bell, is feline. Okay, um, Taurus, if you guys know that symbol from, um, what's it called? Like our birth symbols, like I'm a Scorpio or whatever. Taurus is one of those and it means a bull. Okay, and some of them make no sense, like the squirrel and the ferret. Um, the dog is Canis lupus familiaris, and they're adding familiaris behind there because um, Canis lupus can also be like a wolf. So they're adding, um, as it, they become two species, they're changing the name. So Felis catus, that's where we get the term cat from, um, and so on. Okay, the ferret is called a stinky weasel thief. That's what Mustela putiorus furo actually translates to. And it's true, right? They are stinky and they do seal things. Okay. All right. So if we look at um, this one here, it shows the kingdom names and all the taxa names for the cardinal, the gorilla, and the human. If you notice with the cardinal and the gorilla, they weren't very creative with the genus and species name. Cardinalis, cardinalis, and the gorilla is gorilla, gorilla. That's real creative there. Okay, but they're showing you all the kingdom phylum class all the way down. If they had to ask you which ones were more closely related, you pick the ones that have the same, uh, I mean, more amount of groups in common. So that would obviously be the gorilla and the human because we're the same all the way down to the order. Okay, and of course the cardinal will be in its own category because it's a bird, whereas the other two are mammals. Okay, all right, let's do this example. Organism A, B, C, it doesn't even tell you what they are, except you know they're all animals. Um, you can tell that A is an insect and B and C are mammals. Now, a lot of kids screw this one up. So if I say which two are more closely related, a lot of people would pick A and C because they both have domestica in their name. Okay, that just means that they're found around the house. All right, it's just a generic term. The two that would be most closely related would be B and C because they're same all the way down to the carnivore level. Okay, and just so you know, this first one is a house fly. This is the wolf that we talked about, and this is a house cat. So that's where the term domestica comes in. Okay, all right, so guys, I'm gonna stop there and give you some things to practice on, and then we'll head into the different kingdoms. Um, probably Friday or as we move into next week. So remember to email me if you have any questions, okay? Thank you.